I want to tell you a little bit about contemporary slavery. I want to tell you a little bit especially about uh, some recent work that's, that I've just been doing over the last few years that link contemporary slavery with some other very large issues. But first, I'm going to give you a tiny bit of the picture of slavery in the world. We're actually up from 27 million. We're at about 35 million now. Uh, it's not because we believe there's actually been an increase in slavery. It's because our measurements have gotten much more precise in the last five years. But this is a density map of slavery in the world today. 35 million people over these areas, the darkest areas are in fact where the largest number of people are in slavery in terms of the proportion of the population in slavery. So you see a country like Mauritania there in Northwest Africa, which we think has something like 4% of the population is in slavery, or Haiti, which is a tiny dot there in the Caribbean, where we think about 2.5% of the population of the entire country is in slavery, a big difference to some place like the UK where 0.0001% might be in slavery in the UK, even though when we get over 10,000 people, that's a pretty ugly situation. But this is the, this is the situation. One of the things about it that, that's very clear is you cannot find a country of any size whatsoever in which there is no slavery. The only places, the only nation states that we can find which don't seem to have any slavery are the tiny, some of the tiniest island countries with a population of 50,000. But, and even then we're suspect. I, and I used to say, oh, every country except Iceland until I said that in a public venue like this and a woman stood up and said, excuse me, I'm a member of the Icelandic parliament and we have it too. And I said, okay, it's, ev it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. So that, that's a picture of slavery around the globe today. The second thing I want to share with you is that while slavery today is sla what slavery has always been, the complete control of one person by another, that control being enforced through violence and that violence and control being used to support their exploitation economically, sexually, or both, or so forth, there is this one thing that's different about slavery today as opposed to slavery for the last several thousand years. And that is that there has been a complete collapse in the price or the acquisition cost of human beings. So as a stats nerd, I'm allowed one slide like this per talk. And what this is, is a picture of the red line is the global population. And as you know, especially those of us who have lived through a lot of it, the population went insane about 50 years ago and we started at 2 billion, now we're at 7.2 billion. But in that, that blue line is actually the cost of acquiring slaves over the last couple of thousand years. In the past, slaves were expensive. They were investments. If you went back to Alabama in 1850, the cost of a slave then was about 12, the average slave, just an agricultural worker, no, no one super special, just someone, a young man who could, who could work with hand tools in the fields, would cost about $1,200, 1850 dollars which in today's money is about $45,000. In 1850, you could buy a house for $1,200. You could buy hundreds of acres of land. You could also buy about six oxen, but think tractors, or one 19-year-old agricultural laborer. In the past, slaves were major investments. They were insured. They were given as collateral. They were included in people's wills. But with the vast increase in population and the vast increase in the numbers of people around the world who live in very vulnerable, shaky situations, particularly in, in war zones, particularly like refugees, we have a glutted market. We have a glutted supply. And when you, as we all understand, when you glut a supply, you can begin to, you'll see the price drop and drop and drop. We think there's something like 300 million people in the world who are highly vulnerable to enslavement which is actually slightly heartening when we think there's only 35 million who are, are enslaved. But the reality is that the global price has dropped to the point that the average cost of a human being around the world is about, about 60 pounds, about $90, or around $100. In rich countries like this, it's going to be low thousands, but I also know families myself who have been enslaved in places like northern India for as little as 10 or, tw or 20 pounds and that will be even into hereditary slavery. So that's just an important thing to know, that we're operating in a slightly changed economic climate when it comes to this economic, but also viciously violent crime. Now, I wanna talk in particular about work that I've just been publishing, but also gives you a, a global sense of this. 
This is a, this is, these are our slaves in northern India working in a quarry. A quarry that's actually making paving stones that could end up in a garden at the Chelsea Flower Show. And these people are in a hereditary form of slavery called debt, hereditary debt bondage. And this picture is a very rare picture because this is a modern slaveholder. This is a modern slave master. A colleague of mine in India tricked him into posing on a ledge above his quarry with his slaves and talk to him about, you know, what, tell me about what you own. And if you can, you, it's hard to see from I know where you are, but there are little children chopping the stones here, there are dads over there carving them out of the walls, there are women hauling the rocks and so forth for the paving stones. Now, this has been in his family's possession for several generations, but interestingly, not only do they make wonderful profits from this on, their, on the slaves that they have owned for generations, but this is also a complete destruction of land they do not own. This is carved out of a national forest in India, completely destroyed. There's, you can barely see even trees in the background. And the point that I want to tell you about that's brand new, so I'm giving you a little bit of, a, of new news, is that we've now discovered that not only does slavery have this enormous human impact, it also has a tremendous impact on the global environment, on species, and it actually is a major contributor to climate change. It's important to know this because it turns out the potential solutions to both these problems are linked together. Oops, try that again. It was in situations like that that I began to wonder, what if these two things are really in related? I began to see all these anecdotes where I would find people in slavery destroying the environment, and, and I would be so focused on the people in slavery that I wouldn't think through all that was happening around, and it would be later I'd be looking at the photographs and thinking, what if there's a pattern here, not an anecdote? So I wanna take you to just two places to show you the patterns that we discovered. The first is in a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Shunderban Islands in Bangladesh. The Shunderbans, are, is, it's the largest mangrove forest in the world, it's the largest carbon sink in Asia. In other words, it's the largest place that takes carbon dioxide out of the air as opposed to releasing it. So it, you know, it, it takes it away and puts it in the trees and, and helps, helps the environment and so forth. And it's also absolutely and perfectly protected under international and national law. And it's also the home of very important protected endangered species. Now I'm gonna start with a satellite view. I often go up in the satellites to take these pictures. Um, but this is, this is what the Shunderban should like, look like, a completely untouched mangrove forest. And you can see there's something over there on the other side that's not right, right? This is a completely protected forest. Something else is going on there. And it looks like you're seeing buildings and, and you're seeing also places where fishing boats unload their, their, the little walkways up from the river. And it looks like buildings, but it's not. In fact, those are very large drying racks staffed by child slaves. So children all over Bangladesh, Burma as well, are offered, their parents are offered work for these children. They think they're going someplace where it's going to benefit them. They're lured down to these islands and then they are, then they just disappear from their parents and they're locked up, they're locked into the place, they're brutalized, they're worked all hours of the day and night, they're often sexually assaulted and they're doing this processing of fish, drying them and cutting them and gutting them. This is again a fairly rare photograph. That's a modern slave driver beating children to make them go faster up and down the drying racks on this island, particular island of Dublachar in Bangladesh. And the kids work day and night as long as the fish are coming in, sitting in fish guts and so forth. I spoke at length with four of these lads the morning after the night they had escaped from this island. And one of the things that shocked me the most, and I've seen a lot in this space, was I talked to them about what happened, what was your, what health problems faced you in this situation? And they said, well, number one, it was diarrhea. They just called it diarrhea. And they said, we all had diarrhea and we all knew some people who had died, other children who died, died of diarrhea. And I said, okay, what was the next most important thing, most, most dangerous thing that happened? They said, well, that was, absolutely this one thing, which was they all had seen or knew another child who had been eaten by a tiger. 
Now, that, even as someone with years of experience, I have to say, it blew my mind, but it also made sense. The Shunderbin Preserve is one of the last refuges of the Bengal tiger. It's been set aside to preserve the Bengal tiger. And the fact that if you put small children into the preserves of tigers and you take away their forest, what else are they going to do except turn to the children as, as prey? But the part that then becomes very dismaying is that this isn't just because greedy men in Bangladesh want to abuse and profit from children. They're being paid because their products flow into the shrimp that we buy, the frozen shrimp, that processed and dried fish ends up in cat food that we buy. I know I, it's tough to, to put a cat on trial here. I appreciate that cat lovers don't want to know this. And, and you can see how surprised that cat was when I broke the news to him by that look on his face. But, you know, and, and it's heartbreaking to think that, that we might be, you know, bringing our, our beloved kitties something that has actually come from, from the hands of child slaves. Because everywhere I found slave slaves being forced to destroy the environment in horrific ways, it was not simply for the local situation. It was always to feed into global supply chains, like that for frozen shrimp and, and for fish meals that went into to animal food. I'll go one more place, down to the Amazon. All across, and we all understand about the, the importance of the Amazonian forest as, a, as, this, as the lungs of our planet. Now this is a, I'm sorry, this map does, this screen isn't quite big enough to, to let you see, particularly in the back, what this map is about. So I'm gonna do, say, say something about it very quickly. Just that the green on that map is the Amazon, and it's the Amazon that's supposed to be protected and is currently uncut. So the green parts are the uncut parts of the Amazon. This is just the Amazon basin, the southern half of the Amazon basin. This isn't Brazil, but just the Amazon basin. The yellow parts are the parts that are supposed to be protected of the Amazon, but have been cut illegally. And you can see that the yellow all around this kind of crescent around the Amazon basin has been pushed and pu is pushing in toward the center of the Amazon, cutting and cutting, all illegally, all criminally. Now the dots, what's important here are that the red and blue dots, the blue dots are slavery cases, that the ones that they know about, and the red dots are murders so that you begin to get a picture of exactly how slaveholders murder their way and enslave their way into the destruction of something that we all think is very precious. And you take a place like that, a little yellow splotch in the middle of, a, of what's supposed to be a protected Amazonian forest, and you see that there's a big blue dot, meaning more than 50 people were known to be enslaved there, and there's a ring of some 12, 15 murders around that dot where murder has been used to enforce or to punish or simply to dispose of people who are enslaved to do that. This is what it might look like again from the air. That's a, those funny little dots are in fact small clay ovens where all, these, all this wood, all these trees have been cut by slave labor and then burned in ovens to make charcoal. Charcoal? Barbecue? No. In fact, it's for something else entirely. This is what it looks like on the ground, an enslaved worker hauling the charcoal up into a large lorry that will in fact carry a couple of tons of it to an iron smelting plant. They don't have sufficient coal and coke in Brazil to process their iron ore, but they're, they export enormous amounts of iron and steel to the UK, to North America, and so forth. And to process it, they use charcoal made of their own forests which maybe made sense in the 19th century when they thought they had all the trees in, in the universe, but today we know this is, this is kind of a crazy idea. One of the things that I was able to witness while there working with NetSpace was how many of these disposable enslaved workers, because they're so inexpensive, would be used up, sick, injured, and then when they were done with them, they got rid of the witnesses to their crime by simp simply marching them into the woods, shooting them in the head, as they did with these young men that we found three years later, and disposing of them that way. Where does all that go? Well, Brazilian steel is often used in body parts for cars, structures, plumbing fixtures, 
It's one of those supply chains that we don't know as much about, but we're working to understand more and more, but we know, we know it's arriving here. Very often, I, if I'm talking to students, I kick a chair at this point because the steel that goes into the chairs in schools, for example, is very often Brazilian rolled steel. Now, what happened when we began to understand this and then we backed up and said, let's try to get a global picture and see if, if this is, is, is having an impact globally that we're obviously seeing regionally and locally. And it boiled down in some ways to this. If, if you took slavery today and you said, what if slavery were a country? Or what if it were a, a state in the, in the United States? But let's say it was a country. If it were a country with 35 million people and a gross domestic product, a, a, an annual economic activity of about 150 billion is what the ILO, the UN tells us, the slavery produces about 150 billion. Bless you, dear. Sorry. Um, it would be a small and actually relatively poor country. It would be a, a population about the size of Canada, but a, a economic activity about the size of Angola. Or who would have even believed that the state of Kansas has 150 billion in, in turnover? I think it must be oil wells or something. But anyway, it would be a small country. It would be a relatively poor country. But when I worked with the UN and we said, how much of the deforestation of the planet is now being conservatively assigned to the illegal deforestation accomplished with slave labor, and we calculated that through, it turns out that this small, poor country called slavery would be the third largest emitter of CO2 in the world after China and the United States. In other words, slavery turns out to be a, one of the very significant contributors to the carbon levels, which are in fact leading to the climate change that we're all very much aware of. Now, that's about as depressing as you might get, until you th realize that if you link together the fact that we're all here today because we want to bring it into slavery, and if we understand that while 35 million people is in fact the tiniest fraction of our global population to ever be in slavery, and that that 150 billion a year is the most tiny fraction of our global economy ever to be represented by slave output. That out of a 7 billion person planet, 35 million and 150 billion actually puts you under the rocks at the very edge of our global society. In other words, slavery in many ways, while seemingly overwhelming and obviously pernicious, is standing at the edge of its own extinction. It's that small in global terms. It's like facing up to smallpox. It's not like facing up to something that no one can address. And it means that, it turns out, that dealing with the situations of enslavement can also change our situations of climate change, as well as others. This is part of our new understanding of, as we lodge situations of child slavery and adult slavery into our larger understanding. We're becoming more sophisticated about it. Part of it's all about the trees. It's all about getting those trees replanted so that they can start taking CO2 out of the air. And I'll just jump to here and say, but it turns out even there, there are very clear ways you can join these two efforts together and they become a win-win. One tiny example. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of slaves around the world being forced at gunpoint to, to deforest the, the center of the planet all around the equator. We know that if they can be brought out of slavery and we were to ask them if they wanted to have paid jobs replanting the very forest they'd been cutting, that in fact it would generate something like 48 billion in carbon credits, more than enough not just to pay them, but to bankroll virtually all known needed anti-slavery work around the world. More than enough. So I'll just finish with this. Do you remember the families that you saw in the quarry at the beginning? These are those families after their village went through a process of liberation. One of the things that the women particularly, and especially the older women in that village said after liberation was, number one, we want to school for our children because schooling stops slavery. But number two, they said, we remember from our grandmothers the forest.
that was so wonderful in our lives, and we want to replant that forest. And that was the day the children began to lead the parade to replant that forest. We helped out with some World Bank money and 15,000 seedlings and so forth. But they began to replant that forest and make a new life, not just for the slaves in freedom, but for the forests where they could return that world into a natural place. Now, forgive me, but I'm just gonna show you the cover of the new book, which has all this in it. It's called Blood and Earth. Right. Thank you.